you are living by these kingdom principles, then you will be salt and you will be light. Uh, Christ isn't commanding it here. Uh, He's just simply pointing out that the natural thing that you will be in this world when you are a child of God, uh, when you are a Christian, when you're part of that kingdom, uh, is salt and light. Uh, So what we want to do over at least the next few moments uh, is kind of figure out, okay, if we're part of the kingdom, we will be salt, we will be light. But what exactly does that mean? Well, obviously it's not literal. Um, it's figurative. Uh, and just like any piece of uh, figurative language, it has to be interpreted. Uh, so what does he mean when he says salt? Uh, and then what does he mean when he says light? Uh, so let's deal with the salt first. Now, what do you think that means? You are the salt uh, of the earth. Uh, and then he goes into talking about you not being uh, salt or salt losing its saltiness. And it's only good for, you know, trampling under, you know, the foot. Uh, so he doesn't really give any kind of nuance here uh, as to exactly what this salt is doing. Uh, he just simply expects them to, to know and, and to understand um, what he was talking about, what he was talking about. And maybe we should kind of start there. Uh, when they talked about salt or when Jesus talked about salt, do you think it's, uh, you know, do you think it's the, the same, uh, for, it was the same for them as it is for us? I mean, they, they picked up, uh, you know, a, what a clay utensil and there on that clay or the earthen utensil was the little girl with the umbrella? No, no, probably not, right? Okay, salt is salt. I mean, it, it is what it is, but... Um, the, the purity of the salt is something that they would have to be concerned with. Uh, you know, there, there is, um, anybody ever get Dead Sea salt? You ever go to the mall and you see those folks who talk about Dead Sea salt? And they've got the kiosk and they're, they're typically kind of aggressive, uh, you know, trying to get you to either buy something or whatnot. But, you know, we, we had some Dead Sea salt uh, one time that uh, someone brought back. It was kind of unpurified. And, you know... You see it there, and it's like those candle things that are made of salt, and they're pink. You, you people put candles in. You ever see those? Yeah, they, they, I don't. We we had a couple of them, uh, and uh, you know, first thing I want to do is just kind of lick it, see what it tastes like. Uh, but we did. We tasted the dead sea salt, and uh, it, it's very bitter, very bitter. It's not something you would want to grind up and put on your uh, put on your food, uh, because see, not all salt is is, is pure. Uh, they would not have had places that would, uh, you know, purify, you know, uh, salt. And perhaps they had a method of doing that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, to just simply get salt from, you know, the Dead Sea or, or some other place um, didn't guarantee that it was necessarily, you know, pure. Uh, but they did have salt. Uh, and it was uh, available. But, it, you know, purification was kind of a, an issue. Uh, but what do you think he means salt here? Surely. Okay. All right. Yeah, we, we, we have a few sayings that have salt in them, don't we? You know, he's an old salt or, or man, those people are, they're just salt of the earth. Uh, kind of people. And I, I think both of those probably borrow from the biblical phrase. Um, but, um, you, you know, in, in that sense, does it speak to wisdom? Probably so. Uh, in, in the biblical sense, uh, it, it speaks of knowing God. Is that, is that knowing all about God? Having that same wisdom, only spiritual wisdom? Okay. John? Right. Okay. It, yeah, it it enhances uh, is one of those qualities and um it's it's amazing how much that is so. You know, uh, and 
If you're like most guys, I don't read the back of the package. I typically don't check out the ingredients. My wife does that, and she tells me. Um, but um, salt is in a lot more things than we think. And uh, there's, a, especially in you know, our day and age, um, uh, you know, this amazing, wonderful, fantastic uh, invention called salted caramel. You ever had anything salted caramel? Oh, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. But, you know, who would think, hmm, caramel? I think I'll put a little salt on that. Uh, but all it really does is enhance the, fl- the flavor of the caramel because that's what salt does. It's a flavor enhancer. It, it brings out the natural flavors that are in something, uh, that are in something. And, and I think that's true. The same thing with, you know, Christianity. Um, or those who are members of the kingdom, or those who are engaging in these things that Christ just finished talking about. You know, when you do these things and you are this kind of person, uh, then it's just going to naturally bring out the goodness in things. You know, it's going it's to be that thing which, you know, to use John's word, uh, creates that uniqueness um, that we wouldn't see if we otherwise did not have these people you know, in uh, the mix, in, in the mix. Diane? It's an essential mineral? Yeah, it, it is. Um, you know, we, 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 we talk a lot uh, about, you, you know, reducing your sodium intake. And, and that's because we you know, especially as, as you grow, you know, older, and especially if you have trouble with, you know, blood pressure, uh, doctors will talk to you about, you know, reducing your sodium intake um, <clears throat> to reduce your, um, to reduce your blood pressure. Uh, but it's probably because, well, salt is in everything. Uh, it's a great uh, preservative, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, in a few moments. But um, to... To, um, to this ancient culture that did not have prepackaged, processed, you know, foods, um, that really wouldn't be the, the issue uh, for them. Um, you know, he, he's not saying, hey, Christians will raise your blood pressure. Uh, you need to avoid them. Uh, that's kind of a modern, you know, development. Uh, but yeah, Diane, that's, it's, that's another thing to, to consider. Uh, and that's a very, very good one. Anyone else? Okay, yeah, um, preserves. Um, and, I mean, that's, that's probably the main quality um, or the main reason you're going to find it in so many things uh, today. Um, it, it is just a, a very, very good um, preservative. A very good preservative. Uh, you, you know, there was a while, uh, a while ago, um, you know, there was a... Uh, big, big discussions, and people talked all about, you know, um, especially buffet-type places. They talked about, you know, you, you saw signs go up, no MSG. Well, you know, monosodium glutamate. Uh, sodium there is salt. It's a preservative. Uh, and they would put this on there, and people would get dry mouth and headaches and uh, things of that nature because it had so much, uh, you, you know, on these things to preserve them. Um, it, it's the reason why that, uh, you know, go home and take a can of soup uh, out of your, you, you know, pantry. Uh, and, and you'll notice it's very high in sodium content, um, partly because it's in a can and it's probably going to sit there for a decent amount of time. Uh, it's a preservative, um, you know, but people have been using it for even before then, um, curing meat uh, with, with salt. Uh, I remember the first time I, I ever had a... Uh, country ham? I mean, you like country ham? 
no salt in that at all, is there? No, man. I mean, it's, it's like 50% salt, 50% ham. You know, you got to cook it the right way. But I mean, it's, uh, it's very, very salty uh, because it's cured uh, in, in a brine. Uh, that makes it, uh, you know, very, very salty. But pickles, things like that, that are tr- you're preserving uh, or have that brine mix, um, has a lot of salt in it. Glenn? Right. Yeah, that's true. It, like, again, a whole different uh, kind of set of cultural norms, but it's a preservative. Um, how does it preserve spiritually? Well, well there's a couple of different ways. Uh, I, I think that, uh, n- number one, if, if we're doing what we're supposed to do, um, being the example, um, being the, the, the person who is uh, the, the member of the kingdom that we need to be, uh, then uh, we are setting that example of what it means to walk in the footsteps of Christ or, or to be uh, of the mind of Christ. But I think second of all, uh, we, we preserve um, in that same vein by teaching, uh, you know, God's truth, uh, by teaching his truth. Um, there is no uh, other way to preserve uh, the, the soul for the day of, of eternity uh, than with uh, the application of uh, the, the gospel. Uh, And Christians alone, you know, have that, um, you know, because Christ uh, is the only way to the Father. Uh, You know, that's why Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, So um, Christians alone have that uh, preservative uh, quality. Any other ways you can think of? No, I think another way maybe that... uh, being a member of the kingdom can act as a, a preservative is that it, it does uh, make every attempt, even though life sometimes brings it to you, um, to keep you from situations uh, that will often place you in, in harm's way or in, in the way of uh, the path of sin, which can not only complicate your life, uh, but certainly put you in you know, mortal uh, peril. Uh, I mean, the Bible over and over warns us uh, against certain paths. Uh, you know, don't, don't do these things, abstain from these things, um, don't let this get the best of you, uh, so on and so forth. Give no place, no foothold uh, for, you know, sin to be a part of your life. Uh, and, and the Bible, you know, does that uh, for us. Uh, and therefore, you know, when we put that out into the world, uh, it, it is uh, doing it for them uh, as well. Uh, and acting with the intention of preserving uh, people spiritually. Okay, so let's move on to light. Uh, move on to light, because um, I do want to introduce the next section too. Uh, how, is, uh, uh, how are Christians like light? Well, you, you know, I mean, you can go through the Bible, and, and light is used in, in a number of different ways, but there, there's one that stands out. Uh, among the rest, going all the way back uh, to the Old Testament, to the Old Testament um, and the lampstands that were supposed to be part of the the tabernacle and then those that were part of the temple complex. Uh, And then when you finally get to the book of Hebrews, um, you you know, I believe Paul uh, explains there that those things were really just a figure. Uh, And they were a figure of this one simple idea um, that we could call by, that we could call by a couple of different names. Uh, to, to give it the most broad name, it would just simply be truth. Truth. Um, to give it a more specific name, it would be God's word. God's word. Uh, it is the light. Uh, if you go to the to the psalmist, the the psalm says um, that uh, you know God's word is like a what, like a light, like um, you, you remember. Yes, it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay, Uh, so God's word is truth. Um, And of course, that truth has the ability to uh, do many, many things, you know, for us. Uh, But um, 
I, I do think we want to explore those couple ideas uh, for just a, a little bit, but any other things you can think of as far as light goes? Yeah, just like salt, you know, and we don't think of it because, well, we're in it every day. Uh, Our very existence depends upon light. You know, I mean, you you think about about the way God made the world and the order in which he made it. Um, He puts light first. Well, why? Why is light first? Well, because everything else is going to depend on it. You know, I mean, how do plants do what they do. Well, you know, what is it, make chlorophyll? Uh, but all of that uh, is powered by the sun uh, and the light, uh, you know, that they receive. Uh, and of course, they give off oxygen and we give off carbon dioxide. And so there's this wonderful exchange that takes place uh, between plant life and human beings. And uh, of course, we like to eat, right? Even though some of us don't like our veggies, we kind of maybe like the cows or other animals that like the veggies, um, you know, depending on what kind of diet you eat. But, you know, life as we know it would pretty much cease to function. It is, like salt, one of those basic necessities uh, of life, uh, of life. Uh, and therefore, it, it, it comes as, as a primary or the primary um, I- event uh, of creation. Yeah, amazing point, wonderful point. Yes. Okay, yeah, you're going to First John, uh, chapter 1. Um, you know, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Uh, you, you know, uh, and the blood of Christ, you know, cleanses us. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we, we are created to walk in his, um, you know, spiritual light. And of course, it, it is that primary uh, application in a spiritual sense that we're looking at. Um, you know, we are creatures who were uh, created to uh, embrace and walk in, in the truth that God has given us. Now, the truth comes in a number of forms. Uh, whether it's the natural world around us or through his son uh, or through the word delivered by the spirit, um, God has given us or shown the light upon us in that spiritual sense. Okay. Anything else that light does? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, and truth there can be the exchange for light. As a matter of fact, John does it uh, in John fourteen six. Way truth light. Uh, if you go over to First John, he exchanges um, you know light for truth uh, there, um, and it's a basic same basic idea. Uh, that, that we find all, throughout all of Scripture, you, you know. So if you're walking as uh, part of this kingdom, if you're living that kingdom life, then you are the walking truth, uh, the walking truth, okay? All right, one other thing that I want to mention. Um, maybe we don't always think of it, um, but light is a, a very powerful cleanser, a very powerful cleanser. You know, um, where does the mold grow? In the darkness, right? Cool, damp places not exposed to direct sunlight, right? 
you know, uh, that's where the, the kind of nastiness, the fungi, the stuff that, uh, you know, uh, we think of as I- infecting and impurity, uh, that's where it grows. Uh, you expose those same things to light uh, and it, it kills them, kills them off. Uh, light uh, is a cleanser. Uh, it's a cleanser, you know, and it's a powerful, powerful cleanser. Um, I mean, all you got to do is just take a, take a look at any car that's been parked outside in Florida for eight to ten years plus. Man, forget about that clear coat. You know, you're, you're lucky to have paint, uh, and the paint's probably, you know, faded, uh, and it's kind of useless to go get those little touch-up bottles because it's not going to match. Um, well, why? Well, because, what do we say? The light will what to, to the color? Bleach it out? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a cleanser in that sense. Now, it's annoying in that sense, but it, it does. It acts kind of like a bleach. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, Ralph. Well, I'm sure... Mm-hmm. Really? Interesting. Yeah, if you didn't hear Ralph, he said uh, that, you know, if you live in darkness for long, you go blind. Um, you know, and uh, gave the example of mules in uh, uh, West Virginia mining towns. They, when they were done at the end of the day, they would just, you know, they would just corral them up inside the mind, and eventually they, they would go blind. Didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Like rats off a sinking ship, that kind of thing. All right. All right, let's go back to the text then. He says, uh, you are, light, you are the, the light of the world. A city set on a hill uh, cannot be hidden, uh, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Now, there's a command. Let your light shine be- before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So ultimately, the purpose... Uh, of the light, uh, and we can assume, I think so, uh, the salt too, uh, is to give God, you know, glory, uh, to give God glory, um, you know, and, and so that people can see it uh, and know uh, that not only is there a, a God, but that they too uh, can glory in him. All right. Any other uh, comments? We went through some of this last week, but verses 13 through 16. Okay. Well, we've got a few moments left, so we're, let's go ahead and jump down to verse uh, 17. And we're just going to read 17 through 20. 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass <clears throat> from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. So these are passages that we typically go to uh, when we want to talk about, uh, um, well, Primarily, the distinction between sort of the Old Testament uh, and, and the New Testament. Uh, Christ here is stating a couple of uh, uh, things that we recognize uh, in this uh, Christian era uh, as being, you know, true uh, and, and valid. Now, unfortunately, uh, there, there's just a lot of confusion uh, about these passages, uh, and they are very, very widely I- interpreted very widely interpreted. Uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time here uh, and try to figure out exactly uh, what uh, Jesus is talking about and exactly what he means 
uh, by uh, all of these things. So let's just kind of go back to 17 uh, and make some general observations first. Uh, First observation. Uh, Verse 17 is going to be the verse from which the rest of the chapter uh, kind of takes its uh, bearing. Uh, Think of it as sort of the summary statement uh, for the rest of the chapter. Uh, As you may recall, having read the the Sermon on the Mount before, uh, beginning in uh, verse 21, uh, Christ is going to start this series of statements. Uh, You have heard it said, and then he gives something from, you know, uh, the Old Testament or from something that was based on uh, Old Testament law, uh, and then states, uh, uh, states kind of the upping of the ante, if you want to put it that way, uh, of the law. So really, verse 17 is going to be kind of the takeoff uh, for the rest of it. And let's just kind of read it again together. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill uh, them. Okay, so number two, uh, what do you think uh, is the law and the prophets? The law and the prophets. Okay, so everything that Moses wrote down, and Moses wrote uh, what? What did Moses write? First five books of the Bible, sometimes we call that the Pentateuch, all right, Pentateuch meaning five. All right, so you have the law as delivered by Moses. What about this prophet part? There are a couple of phrases that are used throughout the scripture that are going to come to play here. Um, One... Uh, is a repetition of this phrase, the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. It, it occurs more than just this time uh, within the Bible. But then there's another phrase that's kind of, you know, like it. Uh, it's the law and the Psalms and the prophets uh, occurs uh, as well. Uh, and, um, you know, people who have studied uh, these things linguistically uh, in languages, uh, you know, like Hebrew, which is where most of this is going to uh, uh, occur. Um, tell us that when these folks talked about the law and the, and the prophets, um, what they were trying to do uh, was basically kind of put a bookend on all uh, that would be accepted as scripture prior to the time of Christ. You know, from the beginning, uh, which Moses wrote about. Now, was Moses, are Moses' books the first books written? No, I mean, they detailed the first events, uh, but they probably weren't the first books written. Um, most scholars uh, think that Job is probably the first book written uh, for a couple of different reasons, uh, but uh, namely because Job was uh, a patriarch, uh, and um, lived during that age, and, and the book is attributed to him. So um, most people see that as probably the oldest book in, in the Old Testament. Um, so as far as age goes, it, you know, the, the giving of the law, uh, or actually um, the, uh, the detailing of the account of, of creation, uh, is, is really not the oldest. Um, it's the oldest as far as events go. And, and I think that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, from that very beginning until, you know, the, the closing of that revelation with the book of Malachi. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, from uh, the law through the prophets, if you want to kind of think of it that way. Uh, so when this particular phrase is used, um, it's talking specifically about um, the whole of God's revelation, you know, prior to the time uh, of, you know, Christ. Uh, and... Um, Again, that's what most scholars believe that he's talking about here. So Christ comes along and he says, look, I'm not going to do away with all of the stuff uh, that uh, has come before me. Uh, You know, I'm not going to do away with, you know, all of those things that, um, you know, Moses wrote and that Jeremiah wrote uh, and that uh, all of these other, you know, men in the Old Testament uh, wrote. But instead, I came to, you know, fulfill uh, them. Uh, Now, what does that mean? What do you think that means? How, how is he going to fulfill those scriptures? Because, see, the law is, is I mean, prophecy is kind of a, an easy thing to understand, right? I mean, there are 300 plus, 350 plus prophecies concerning, 
you know, Christ alone in the Old Testament. Um, when he says he's going to fulfill those, that's kind of obvious. But what about the law? How is Christ the fulfillment of the law? Yeah, and that, that's, a very, that's very good. And that's the easiest way to say it without uh, getting into too many details. But I mean, if you go back and you really, really, really start looking at the, uh, the Old Testament um, and consider it through the eyes of what the New Testament or how the New Testament refers to it, that it was kind of a, a tutor or a schoolmaster to bring us to the fullness of Christ, what you start to realize is that there are these pictures, some of them vast murals uh, that are painted in the Old Testament that point directly to uh, Christ, his ministry, the building of the church, uh, and so on and, and so forth, and not just the prophetic ele element. Uh, for instance, if you take the feast days, uh, just take the feast days alone uh, of, uh, you know, the Jewish law, uh, you'll find within those feasts uh, a symbolism that just points you to the time of, you know, Christ and his sacrifice uh, and, um, you know, all of the things that kind of attend it. Uh, most of us uh, remember, um, the, remember the, the symbols most readily for uh, things like, um, let me word it a little different way. Most of us remember when it comes to these symbols and things like that, the Passover. Uh, because that one's kind of painted very, very clearly for us uh, in the New Testament. I mean, John the Baptist, at the beginning of the ministry of Christ, would look at Jesus and say, you know, behold the Lamb of the world that, you know, takes away, or behold the Lamb of God that takes away the, the, the sins of the world, right? Uh, you know, and it was a single lamb, and it was, you know, slaughtered, and the door, the, you know, the blood was put on the, the doorposts, and um, what did it stop? Well, it stopped them from, you know, firstborn from dying. Uh, from dying. Uh, and it becomes that, you know, symbol that is used for Christ uh, and his sacrifice uh, in the New Testament. Uh, but it's not the only one. Um, all of these things from, from the, uh, the things used in the temple and tabernacle, um, you read the book of Hebrews, you find that they have symbolic reference to the New Testament uh, as well. Um, the feast days, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, Christ came to fulfill them, or to make them full, uh, would perhaps be a better way to, uh, you know, put it. Um, they were, someone once said, the shadow, uh, and Christ is the substance. Um, you, you know, they kind of gave you that image of what it was going to be, uh, but Christ is the real thing, uh, and... Uh, the reality uh, of what is, right? Was that bell one or bell two, Dennis? That was two? Okay. All right, any last comments? All right, we'll pick up there next time. Um, it's important to understand verse 17. We'll, we'll dig kind of into this a little bit. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the misinterpretations uh, of it. Uh, so read through it uh, again a couple of times. Maybe make some observations, do some reading, verses 17 through 20. Oftentimes when communion is served, I'll turn to uh, Psalms 22 and begin reading with verse 1 there. Uh, the words written by David, the psalmist, in this song were later uh, repeated by Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. These words were, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? When you listen to these words and then you think it's not Christ on the cross at this time, but right now it's David saying this, there's this question we need to ask ourselves. Have we ever done this? Have we ever made complaint? And when I say complaint, or have we ever asked from being just completely overwhelmed by life. Why, 
Why does this happen, Lord? Why? I want to tell you one good thing, first of all. If you do, you're not the first person to ever do that. When we ask questions of the Lord, His ear is open to us. He understands His ways are not our ways. His ways are much higher than our ways. He is the sovereign God. And so when we, in our frustration, might, like David, ask these things, and of course Christ was justified in His questioning of this because He, as the Holy One, the Perfect One, hung there on the cross for us. We, too, ask these same questions from time to time, don't we? When we just feel overwhelmed by life. Now, I said that God understands this, but I also want us to understand that sometimes we start to have a sense of entitlement and we feel like we can question our maker. And I would think about the words of uh, Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 45, verse, uh, verse 9. Here, Isaiah is speaking or writing about giving to the people information about God's choosing Cyrus, okay, to be this king who's going to eventually deliver Israel. No, he is not an Israelite. He is the king of Persia. But what we have here is we see God's mighty hand at work. It says in verse 1 of chapter 45, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. You see, he's saying, OK, I'm going to use you as an instrument for deliverance of my people. What we see here is the sovereignty of God. He says, this is what I have chosen. I said just a minute ago, that sometimes we'll ask these questions, Lord, why is all of this befalling me? Now, here in this instance, God, through his servant Isaiah, is saying, here is how I am going to deliver my people. He goes on to say, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. And then he says these words, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among the earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to a father, What are you begetting? Or to a woman, With what are you in labor? So here's what I'm saying. There are times that we're frustrated. We can become very frustrated at some points in life because of the things that have befallen us. And many times it's not because of some misdeed. It's not because there is sin, but because things in the world have been such that we are feeling overwhelmed by whatever it is that we face. But we have these words of James over in the New Testament that can give us strength. And in James, the first chapter, beginning with verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. 
For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When Jesus gave the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and he was talking about the, or he was giving the Beatitudes. At the close of those Beatitudes, we see those who are being persecuted for righteousness sake. You see, the things that befall us sometimes, we've been doing right, and all of these things come upon us and we can't understand it. But you see, there's that steadfastness that can come from being hit with all of these things. Because remember, our Lord, our exemplar, was one who faced more than we would ever face in our lives. So tonight, you might be here with a real burden, and you might need the prayers of your brothers and sisters here at church. You also might be someone who has never allowed the Lord to lift your burden, and Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is the rest giver. He's the Prince of Peace. And he's the only one that can give us that peace that Paul talked about as a peace that passes all understanding. Tonight he invites you to come to him. To come to him giving your life to him. To come to him rededicating your life to him. To come to him just asking for the prayers of your brothers and sisters because you feel overwhelmed by what the world has presented to you at this time. If you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing.